When we talk about managing heat and animals dealing with heat, there are four ways to gain or lose heat. Radiation, conduction, convection, and evaporation. I'll give you a sketch to think about these. So here's a simple sketch in which radiation is in orange here. Here's the sun. And of course the sun is producing high amounts of infrared radiation and anything that sunlight hits will pick that up. Every solid object, every object, radiates infrared in direct proportion to its surface temperature. So it's radiating heat from its surface. So some of the heat that an animal picks up from the sun, it's radiating back to the sun, but it's a much smaller amount. It's also radiating heat out into the atmosphere. And because solid objects are not out there and there's not much heat coming back from most of the gases in the atmosphere, it gets relatively little back. If you're an animal near another animal, you're radiating heat to that other animal. And if it's the same temperature as you, it's radiating back exactly the same amount that you're radiating to it. Convection, sorry, conduction <clears throat> in red here, Conduction is heat lost because molecules that are in contact, or objects that are in contact, the molecules bouncing around in one can run into molecules of the other. So if this is hotter, that molecule vibrating can hit this molecule, transfer a lot of the energy, and have less energy moving away. That's heat transfer going from one and retaining here, this molecule left inside the animal is now cooler. We've transferred heat to this other object. Of course, if the animal is in contact of some, with something hotter than it is, then the heat transfer will go the other way. Convection is the idea that you can transfer heat by conduction to an air molecule or a water molecule right next to your surface. And that molecule can, can easily either transfer that heat further away or might transfer it back. And so in a, an animal in completely still air or water is actually going to warm up the water near it so, and, um, and that water then will form a little insulating area. But if there's a current of air or water, a wind or water, then that warmed up molecule gets quickly swept away. And that really speeds up heat transfer. The difference between a, an animal on a still day with completely stilled air versus a 10 mile an hour wind is 70 times as much heat loss. Convection is a huge source of loss of heat. Finally is evaporation. And I'm showing it as exhaled air, but it can also be from liquid on the surface. Uh, only the fastest molecules escape. So if we've got water molecules in the lungs here, they're all attached to each other by hydrogen bonding. Which ones manage to get away? Well, if one of them is moving faster than the others, it's the one that gets out to become water vapor, and it's those fastest moving ones that then get exhaled. Only the fastest water molecules evaporate. And if only the fastest evaporate, then it's going to take away heat, because heat is the rate of random molecular motion. Of course, evaporation is useless for aquatic animals because they're in water. Evaporation is not possible. So how do animals tolerate or adjust things in response to temperature? Well, reaction rates increase about two to three times per 10 degree rise in temperature over the range in which animals live. So reaction rates go twice as fast. So how can animals compensate? If your reactions are twice as fast, then you're producing twice as much of your metabolites. You're using energy twice as fast, and you may not have that energy. So how do you adjust to have the same level of activity with a change in temperature? Animals clearly do it. This is called the Q10 concept. Q10 is simple. It's the um, quotient over a 10 degree rise in temperature, the reaction rate of any reaction at some degree centigrade, divided by the reaction rate at 10 degrees lower. 
So if that number is 1, it means the reaction rate is exactly the same. This number is equal to this one, then Q10 is 1. For lots of reactions, that number is 2 to 3. It's twice as high, or three times as high, at 10 degree higher temperature. But when you measure reaction rates in animals of reactions, often the Q10 is remarkably close to 1. So clearly they're compensating in some way. How do they compensate? Well, the main way they compensate is by changing enzyme concentrations or substrate less often. So if the reaction rate is twice as fast at a higher temperature, so 2x reaction rate but one-half the enzymes, then we've perfectly compensated. The reaction rate has sped up, but we're only producing half the enzymes, and so the reaction is going to take place at the same rate. And they can also adjust substrates to do the same kinds of things. So that's the major mechanism that animals use. In some cases, animals actually change which enzymes they use, so they may express a different gene. For example, um, there are um, there are genes for for glycolysis in some fish, in which in the winter they're expressing a different gene that has a faster reaction rate than in the summer. They express a gene for an enzyme that has a slower reaction rate, and during the transition between seasons, they change the proportions. So halfway between the seasons, they're using half of one form of the enzyme and half of the other. Finally, I want you to be thinking about two continua. Body temperature can vary over time, and the source of heat that a body gets can differ. Let's first look at body temperature varying over time. We talk about homeotherms, homeo, same. Body temperature is always the same. And we talk about poikilotherms, terrible term, but the body temperature changes with the environment. Poikilo is a root for changing and therm for temperature. So we have animals like insects whose body temperature changes with the environment and mice whose body temperature is, al are, is always the same. We can also talk about the source of heat in a body in which case we have endotherm, uh, sorry, ectotherms that get their heat only from the environment, ecto for outer, and generate their own body heat, endotherms, endo, the heat comes from inside, endo. And all four populations are possible, although they're not equally common. Animals can be poikilotherms and ectotherms, that's insects, reptiles, um, lots of fish, so they're poikilotherms and ectotherms. Temperature changes with the environment, and they get heat only from the environment. They can be um, poikilotherms and endotherms. So the temperature changes with the environment, but they generate most of their own body heat. There aren't a lot of examples of these, but hummingbirds are one of them. Hummingbirds can't feed at night, and they don't get enough energy when they're not feeding to maintain a high body temperature. So hummingbirds typically let their body temperatures drop down quite a bit, often to near ambient, near the actual temperature in the air, during the night, and then warm up again during the day. So they are poikilotherms. They do change their body temperature during at least some of the time, but they're also endotherms. Mostly they use their own body heat, so that's hummingbirds. Animals can be homeotherms and ectotherms. That one sounds a little surprising. Wait a minute, how can you keep your temperature always the same if you get heat only from the environment? And good examples of these are deep ocean fish. If you're a deep ocean fish, the temperature is always somewhere around 4 or 5 degrees centigrade. It never changes. And so you get your heat only from the environment, but your body temperature is always the same, down around 4 or 5 degrees centigrade. And then homeotherms and endotherms body temperature always the same, generate their own body heat. That's most mammals and most birds. We generate our own body heat and most mammals and birds maintain a 
constant body temperature. Even then, it's mostly a core body temperature. So the body temperature that's staying the same would be the core, brain, and the core, including the heart. The outer parts of the body are allowed to be a bit cooler, and the legs and the tail and the ears may be a lot cooler. In fact, your hands function perfectly well when they get down into the 80 degrees Fahrenheit range. They just feel colder.